Chapter Twelve of The Blue Envelope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording today by Don Larson in Minnesota. The Blue Envelope by Roy J. Snell. Chapter Twelve. What is that? When the men had gone, Phi sat down upon an upended ice cake to rest and think. His logical course was evident enough, to wait for perhaps half an hour, allowing the man, who would doubtless be able to overtake his guide, to get a sufficient distance ahead to prevent any further unpleasant encounters. Still, he was glad now to have his rifle, as small as it was. He brought only a few cartridges for it, as they were an added weight. These had been spilled from his pocket in the scuffle, but by a diligent search he had been able to find five. He was about to abandon the search when, with an exclamation of astonishment, he sprang forward and, bending, picked up an envelope. "'The blue envelope!' he exclaimed. "'My envelope! He must be the bearded miner the girls told me about. It was lucky he tried to assassinate me after all.' The envelope had been torn open, but the letter, though blurred with grime and dirt, was still in it. With eager fingers he pulled it out. "'Couldn't read our cipher, so he was going to Nome for help, I reckon,' he muttered. "'All I've got to say is, it's lucky he lost it, and I found it.' He read the missive hastily, then a light of hope shone in his eyes. "'If only I can make it back to the American shore,' he exulted. Rover, old boy, get back on your job. We're going to the islands. Hopefully he hurried forward, but they had tarried too long, for not a hundred rods from their starting point they came upon a broad, dark break in the ice floe, such a break as no drawbridge of ice would ever span. And, like the other, it's endless, Fy groaned, as his eye swept the line from left to right, and from right to left again, then he sat down to think. A half hour before this Lucille had said to Marianne, "'Listen, I think I hear a dog bark.' They listened, and the bark came to them very distinctly. "'Is it Rover, or does it come from the island?' asked Lucille. "'I can't tell,' whispered Marianne. For some time they listened. When at last they prepared to resume their journey, Lucille glanced upward again. Then a cry of consternation escaped her lips. The fog had thickened. The stars were lost to them. They were again adrift on the trackless floe, without compass or guide. At the moment when Phi sat down to think, they were just coming in sight of that same break in the floe, on the side of which he sat. They were not a mile apart, but the distance had as well been a hundred miles as, in this labyrinth of ice floes, no person finds another, and, as it turns out, Phi took the trail to the left, and they the one to the right. When the two girls chose to travel to the right along the break, they could not have told why, nor why they traveled at all, unless because motion quieted their nerves and served to allay their fears. Perhaps there was something of providence in it. Certainly it did bring them a bit of good fortune. Lucille had rounded a gigantic ice pile when suddenly she gripped Marion's arm. What's this? she exclaimed. A brown object lay some distance ahead of them. With bated breaths they crept cautiously forward. It might be a bear or a walrus. Suddenly Marion threw up her head and laughed. It's only a kayak. Some Eskimo has left it on the ice and the floe has carried it away. "'May be a valuable find. Let's hurry,' exclaimed Lucille. Breaking into a run, they soon reached its side. "'Let's explore it,' whispered Marion. "'You take the forecastle, I'll take the after-cabin.' She laughed as she thrust her arm into the open space toward the stern of the kayak. "'Why, there's something there!' she exclaimed. "'Something here, too,' answered Lucille excitedly as her slender white hand tugged away at a bundle which had been thrust into the prow of the boat. "'It's like going through your stocking Christmas morning,' laughed Marion. 
for a moment quite forgetting their dilemma in the excitement of discovery. Marion drew forth a large sealskin sack. It was heavy and tied tightly at the mouth. It gave forth a strange plop as she turned it over. Some sort of liquid, she announced, probably seal oil. With difficulty she untied the strings and opened the sack, then quickly pinched her nose. Phew! What a smell! Let's see, said Lucille, dropping the bundle she had just dragged forth. Yes, it's seal oil. That's a good find. Why, we can't use the stuff. It must be at least a year old and rotten. Talk about Limburger cheese. Ugh. She quickly tied the sack up again. Well, said Lucille, we probably won't want to use it for food, but white people as fine-blooded as we have been compelled to. It's better than starving. But I was thinking about a fire. If we ever find any fuel where we're going, wherever that is, she smiled a trifle uncertainly, we'll need some oil to help start the fire, if the fuel is damp, as most driftwood is. Driftwood? When do we go ashore? laughed Marian. It's well to be prepared for anything, smiled Lucille. Let's see what's in my prize package. Marian leaned forward eagerly while Lucille untied a leather thong. Deerskins, she cried exultantly, four of them, enough for a sleeping bag, and wrapped in a sealskin square which will protect us from the damp. I believe, she said thoughtfully, that this native must have been planning a little trip up the coast, and if he was, there must be other useful things in our ark, for an Eskimo never ventures far without being prepared for every emergency. Once more they bent over the kayak, each one to search her corner. Another sack, cried Lucille, a hunting sack, with matches wrapped in oiled sealskin, a butcher knife, some skin rope, a pair of bula balls with the strings, a fishing line with a hook and sinker, two big needles stuck in a bit of canvas. That's about all, but it's a lot. I found a little circular wooden box, said Marian. More food, I guess. Probably the kind you can't eat without gagging. No, she cried after a moment. Here's a big square of tea, the Russian kind, all pressed hard into a brick. There's enough for a dozen tea parties. Oh, joy, here are three pilot biscuits. Pilot biscuits, Lucille danced about on the ice. These large brown disks of hardtack, so often despised, would not have been half so welcome had they been solid gold. Well, I guess that's about all, but Marian smiled. I'm hungry already, but we daren't eat anything yet. We'll save these and eat the deer meat first that we brought along. We'll be pretty awful hungry, I'm afraid, said Lucille, before we leave the ocean. But what worries me just now is a drink. Do you suppose we could find an ice pool of fresh water? A short search found them the desired ice pool, and each drank to her heart's content. They then sat down upon the top of the kayak for a brief consultation. After talking matters over, they decided that the best thing they could do was to remain by the kayak until the fog cleared. It was true that the kayak, carefully managed, would carry them across the break in the flow, but once across they would be no better off than before, since they had no way of determining directions. Furthermore, neither of them had ever handled a kayak, and they knew all too well what a spill meant in that stinging water. "'Guess we'd better stick right here,' said Marian, and Lucille agreed. "'Now,' suggested Lucille, "'we'll put your middy on the paddle and set it up as a sign of distress then. Since the ice isn't piling, I think we might both sleep a little while. The flag was soon hoisted, and the girls, with the sealskin square beneath them, lay down under the deerskins and attempted to sleep. But the deerskins were not large enough to cover them, and kept sliding off. They were chilled through, and sleeping was impossible. Lucille, said Marian at last, I believe we could set the kayak up, and bank it solidly into place, then creep into it and sleep there. We might, said Lucille doubtfully. 
the kayak was soon set and after many doublings and twistings with much laughter they managed to slide down into it and there with two of the deerskins for mattress and two for covers they at last fell asleep in one another's arms as peacefully as children in a trundle bed oh marian you're too too chubby lucille laughed as she attempted to struggle from the bean-pod like bed after they had slept for some time their first glance at the break in the ice floe told them it had widened rather than narrowed a look skyward showed them that the fog too had thickened lucille's brow wrinkled her eyes were downcast cheer up said marian you can never tell what will happen things change rapidly in this arctic world we'd better explore our ice floe hadn't we and don't you think we could eat a bit before we go cheered by the very thought of something to be done lucille munched her half of the pilot biscuit and bit of reindeer meat contentedly then after they had seen to it that their white middy flag was properly fastened for this must act as a guide back to the camp they prepared to go exploring armed with a butcher knife lucille led the way marian carried the fishing tackle and about her waist were wound the strings of the bula ball quite some hunters laughed marian regular robinson crusoettes several wide circles of the camp revealed nothing but ice the whiteness of which was relieved here and there by spots of water black as night might be fish in them suggested marian yes but you couldn't catch them you can only catch tom cod through a hole in the ice they were becoming tired and had spoken of turning back when marian whispered down she pulled her companion into the dark side of an ice pile a shadow had passed over the ice now it passed again and lucile looking up saw a small flock of ducks circling for a pool of water not twenty yards away what what's the idea she whispered bula balls maybe we can catch one they come from the north not easily scared can you yes my brother showed me how to handle the bula balls you whirl them about your head a few times then you let them go if the string strikes a duck's neck it winds all about it then the duck can't fly with eager fingers marian straightened out the twelve feet of double-strand leather thong there there they're down whispered lucile you stay here if they rise and fly away call me creeping around two piles of ice marian threw herself flat and began to crawl the remaining distance across a flat pan of ice her heart was beating wildly for in her veins there flowed a strain of the hunter's blood of her britain ancestors of many generations back now she was forty feet away now twenty now ten and the ducks had not flown stretching out the thong she rose on an elbow and set the balls whirling over her head once twice three times then up she sprang and with one more whirl sent the string singing through the air the young ducks craning their necks with curiosity did not move until something came crashing at them and a wildly frantic girl sprang toward them to the duck about whose neck the string had encircled this move was too late for marian was upon him and a moment later looking very much like the old woman who went to market with a dead gray duck dangling from her right arm marian returned in triumph oh lucille she cried i got him i got him fine you shall have a medal said lucille but how will we cook him well said lucille after a moment's thought it's growing colder going to freeze hard they say freezing meat is almost as good as cooking it i don't know look cried marian suddenly balancing herself at the crest of a high pile of ice what's all that black a little way over there to the left it's not like ice do you suppose it could be an island is the ice piling there lucile asked clinging to her friend's side no it isn't so it can't be an island for the island would stop the ice as it flows and make it pile up but what can it be 
"'We can't go over there, for we can't see our flag from there.' "'Yes, we can,' said Marian. "'I'll take off my petticoat and put it on this ice pile. "'We can see it from there, and when we get back here we can see the flag.' This new beacon was soon established. Then, with trembling and eager footsteps, the girls hastened to what appeared to be an oasis in a desert of ice. End of chapter 12